So as we were saying about the Life Fair uh, Initiative for Adaptation and Resilience, uh, one of the components that Life Fair is looking at is a, a learning component, which we thought would be good to talk about in this CBA because CBA is a community of practice about learning that has been going on for a long time. And as the LDC chair mentioned at the opening, the LDC, in the last CBA, the Talanoa that happened informed the compact that is, has been signed by the LDCs and the donors. And some of the things that the LDC wants to promote is regional and national learning and uh, capturing good practice, peer support within the LDC countries and learning from good practice happening there and those informing good practice. But then uh, learning has been going on for adaptation. Most of the times we don't learn from the good things that are happening. And sometimes we don't even learn from failure. So we continue failing and failing and not learning from it. And uh, the Life Air Initiative focuses on working in different ways, uh, business and usual ways of doing things. And that also relates to learning. And the learning agenda will also follow the principles that have been signed by the LDCs and the international community, making sure that there's equal partnership and a shared platform, uh, trust, transparency, accountability, uh, focus on the whole of society approach. The reason why the LDC governments are coming in here where we have civil society organizations, private sector, academia and others. And then also working at the pace of uh, individual LDCs, individual groups, men, women, youth and others to make sure that we are focusing on those that are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and they are not left behind. So the learning agenda will also focus on most of those principles that are being promoted within Life AR. So this session is both a sharing from the LDCs. We have two of the front runner countries, the government of Uganda and the Gambia will be sharing on how learning has been happening in their countries, what has worked and what has not worked and what they would want to see happening in life air to make sure that the business as usual approaches are being transformed into more effective learning. We also have, we shall also have uh, experience sharing from the least developed countries initiative, no, the least developed countries universities consortium on climate change, which is also a long term initiative of the LDC group. And the purpose is to strengthen capabilities of LDCs to address adaptation and resilience within their countries. They'll also share their learning experiences and that will happen in the breakout sessions, uh, which have been organized in smaller groups to be able to give us time to really discuss and share in those groups. And uh, before we do that, we wanted to get everybody's views on some questions, which we are going to do through Mentimeter because sometimes the time is short and we may not be able to share. So I request Michael to take us into that and look at the questions and then get general responses. Then we'll go into the breakout groups and have more deeper discussions with learning that comes out from uh, that, that the three that are going to share with us. So one of the questions that we wanted to look at is uh, why learning is important for climate change adaptation and resilience programs. It may sound obvious, we always talk about male and we have lots of frameworks, but the L is always silent in this. So we wanted to hear from you why you think uh, learning is important for climate change adaptation and resilience programs. Michael, uh, so we request you to go to either to your phones or computers and type in www.menti.com and the code is 75700097. Uh, then we do the voting and see what you think about that question. So 
So there's a link as well in the chat box and the codes. So responses are coming in, understanding what works, what does not, and adjusting based on experience on the ground. So no programs are perfect. We need to learn as we go, introducing updated technologies, no magic bullet looking at complex challenges, dialogue with communities of practice, understanding success and failure factors, empowering innovation in addressing climate change issues. So we don't invest and not learn what is already failing, improving to listen to communities, which is really important. Uh, listening to communities in a structured way and responding to with adaptation programs, listening to people, replicating lessons, improving knowledge. Knowledge is power, it's a foundation for great programming, right? Um, scaling up and replicating. So we could look at the effective change. So we are closing in a few seconds, then we look at the second question. Okay, so let's look at the second one. Uh, the second question we wanted to look at is, uh, uh, Michael, if you could put up the second one, the most effective approaches and methods that have worked for you or your institutions. We've been learning for many years and they know, we, we know what works and what doesn't, whether we do it or not. So, what has worked for you or your institution? What you think either methods or approaches that have worked for you or your institutions? Participatory approach, co-generated and peer learning. Participatory rather than formal rate learning. Social learning, participatory approaches. Listening, don't go somewhere with preconceived ideas, that's right. Uh, listening to communities, stories of change and narratives, investing in personal and communication relationships over time. Indeed, that's why life AR is long term because adaptation doesn't happen in a short time, participatory, identifying and working with poorest and marginalized communities, Um, I'm not seeing any more. Are we still voting or we are finished? Michael, is this, I'm seeing the top of the slide. Can it go down? Uh, the third one. So if we are done with that, Michael, we could go to the third. Uh, the third question, we wanted to look at what are the business as usual learning approaches that life AR should avoid? The business as usual that we should avoid and use more effective approaches or things that have been tried before and have not worked. We've done lots of evaluations and these should actually inform what really works and what doesn't. So if you could share some of those, the business as usual approaches that we really need to avoid in this program in terms of approaches, methods. The um, um, uh, Mentimeter hasn't moved on yet, um, Michael. Oh, Michael. Uh, apologies, apologies, I will uh, quickly move that on. Oh, okay, that's the second one, right? Yeah, so that's the third. Uh, 
the business as usual approaches that life air needs to avoid. As practitioners that have been there for years, definitely we know things we've done and have not worked. So it would be great to hear. Log frames, one off training, project based mindset, short termism, I like the word, top down approaches focusing on short outputs, not long-term capabilities and competences. One way provision of information from scientific and powerful institutions, providing services and goods, centralized systems of developing learning materials, lack of ownership, assumptions that donors know exactly what the vulnerable communities need. A need to empower communities, voice, not respecting local knowledge, top down approaches. Um, so, yes, so thank you for those responses. So now what is going to happen, we want this to be as informal as possible to enable, to enable us have a conversation, honest conversation at that. Uh, so we are going to go into five groups. And these groups uh, will have experience sharing from the life air frontrunner countries and the LAC, half of it, and then also hearing from you discussing what they presented and any other additions you might have from your learning. Those are three groups. One will be led by Uganda, the Gambia, and one the LAC. Then we will have two extra groups that will give us external perspectives. These are not government, they are not learning institutions, but these are civil society and others, communities of practice that have been at it for a long time to give us honest feedback on what we really need to do. And one of them will be led by Fiona Percy and another one by Grace Ineza. And uh, we are discussing three questions which will be shown in the breakouts about learning in the countries, the approaches, and then real recommendations on what LIFAR should take forward. So Michael, if you could take us to the groups and please don't forget to click on the join the, your group where you'll be taken into. We are taking 30 minutes, 15 minutes for the, those presenting and 15 minutes for discussion. And in the two groups, it's really like discussing the three questions and giving us that feedback that LIFAR is looking for. So if you have any, uh, any issues or comments or whatever, don't forget to use the chat box as we go through this session. That will be valuable for us as well. So Michael, can you take us to the groups, please? Uh, one second, yes, I'll just have to, um, apparently my uh, pre-assigned didn't work, so I'll just have to do it um, here. So I'll open them uh, slowly one by one. Uh, one thing I would like to ask of people in the breakout groups is that um, whoever is the, the main session host in there uh, presses record um, as soon as you uh, enter just so that we can um, make sure that we capture all the insights from each of the sessions. So um, if you have any questions about how to do that, please um, flag with me and I'll enter the breakout room and help you out. Um, but uh, yes, I will be opening the rooms uh, shortly. So welcome back from the breakout discussions. Uh, more people are coming back. I hope they were useful and I hope you had good discussions. And uh, we are so many, to be honest. Uh, we expected to have fewer people, but we are so many and we had 65 on the waiting list, which is difficult to manage. So I'm going to request that if there's something inspiring or something that you forgot or something you learned in your group, to type it in the chat box because we don't have time to come back and share what we've discussed. I think that will be one way of knowing what happened in one group that you, we are not able to listen to. So we are coming back to a plenary session where we are going to hear from the Decentralized Climate Finance Alliance 
Uh, this is an alliance that has been working so hard on making sure that adaptation funds reach the local level. Uh, and IID has been supporting that work with the go uh, governments and civil society in Kenya, Tanzania, Senegal, Mali, and uh, they have lots of experience. And out of that learning, uh, some governments like the Kenya government is planning to scale up this innovation in the whole country with lots of support from different uh, donors and local governments and communities. So we have a team that has been working on this and uh, have experience to share on what learning they've generated through working with government, through working with civil society and communities. Uh, they are going to talk to us on what Decentralized Climate Finance Alliance has learned about participatory learning, which kept coming up in the Mentimet and the discussions and the challenges and opportunities for mainstreaming learning into national processes and institutions. Since we are looking at LEFAR, which is really like LDC led for LDC countries. So we'll start with uh, Esperanza Karaho, who works with the Adaptation Consortium in Kenya. She's a program officer on developing out, devolve, scaling out devolved climate finance, and they are working on scaling on the whole country to share her experiences with us on the two questions that uh, we discussed. So Esperanza, you have the floor. Okay. Hi, thank you, Tracy. Um, I'm just, I'll try to be quick. So on what the DCF Alliance has learned about participatory planning. Um, first, I'd like to mention that uh, in Kenya, we've, we've had quite a number of approaches. We've used uh, participatory uh, vulnerability capacity assessments. We've used also participatory resource mapping. Uh, we've used focus group discussions. So what we have learned about the participatory planning is that number one, we are able to complement baseline information for measuring impacts. Um, like for example, the investments that were made, the water plants, we've done investments on water plants, wells, sand, sand dams and weirs, which have benefited the community. And some of the films we've had for telling the transformative impacts we can be able to tell from where we started all the way to, uh, uh, as a baseline from where we started to, the transformative impacts we've, we've had. Uh, we've also learned that participatory learning empowers communities. This is because um, the community, usually the members of the community, communities usually come together to work towards a common goal, which in this case is to prioritize an investment that they think is going to, that they believe is going to build some uh, uh, resilience towards climate change and also to help them adapt to climate change. So that means that uh, they are able to come and agree towards uh, and set uh, on what they want to to. Uh, to build resilience. We've also learned that participatory learning brings partners and volunteers and uh, government, county and national into closer contact with communities. Um, basically meaning that there's working with people rather than working for them. Um, now a good example is that uh, it enhances public participation and county planning, uh, you know, during the training of the planning committees uh, transfer of skills and they're able to to be able to actually go sit down again with the community for them to come up with proposals and then all the way to um, approvals at the county level. So basically the partners all work together. And then we've also learned that Participatory learning strengthens participation of beneficiaries in decision making. Um, in the in the policy and legislation of the climate finance, uh, devolved climate finance in Kenya, we've ensured that uh, the structures are inclusive, where we have the marginalized groups sitting in them. Uh, the women, the people living with disabilities and representatives of the youth and also um, community-based organizations 
and NGOs and faith-based. And another thing on uh, strengthening participation is that they also get to know what budget they have so that they are able to plan with it. And meaning basically that we use the bottom up approach and the members of, of the community are able to um, agree, like build a consensus on the goal they want to achieve. Then we've also learned that participatory learning also takes uh, an integrated approach, especially um, in terms of vulnerability, we are able to tap into the community's knowledge of their local needs and risks, so that uh, that is through uh, the PVCs in order to build resilience into the project that the community identifies. And then we've also learned there's value for money and sustainability. Value for money because it optimizes the relevance and appropriateness of the action because as I mentioned, this is a project that has been chosen by the community, meaning it's a bottom-up approach and also sustainability because once the project is completed, it's usually handed, um, after commissioning, it's usually handed back to the community for them to run the investment. So, and, and they are also able now to protect the investment because they are the ones who chose it and they know the importance and they are also the ones who are running it. Then we've also learned that um, uh, there's need, uh, when we talk about the participatory resource mapping, there's need for accuracy in mapping and at least um, somewhere like Garissa and Isiolo, they were able to uh, digitize the perception maps, which makes it easier for uh, policies, the policy makers and planners to make decisions and also for appropriate skill mapping to capture things like resettlement and ecosystem skill for planning. Um, in terms of challenges, the challenges and opportunities for mainstreaming learning into national process and institution, the main challenge uh, we had especially on MAL, that is monitoring, evaluation, and learning, was that um, the Kenya, the Kenya Climate Adaptation Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning uh, framework is is weak, but uh, it is something we were working on. Um, I think last month we uh, went out to the fields to actually capacity build the counties for them to be able, we actually identified, uh, what are they called, a core indicators so that they can, um, they can be able to monitor, evaluate and learn. So the, the main challenge we had there was that we had scattered and unconsolidated uh, climate change indicators um, and monitoring with varying agencies, some sitting in, in national agencies, some sitting in other departments. And also the indicators were not well structured. You'd find that one indicator would measure more variables. So in terms of the opportunities, um, last month we set out to strengthen the climate change monitoring, evaluation and learning system by integrating the county integrated monitoring evaluation and learning system together to the national one so that uh, the indicators that are usually sector and sector sectoral uh, there's a level for reporting that is consistent from the county it feeds into the national then of course use of harmonized tools uh, like baseline tools and data collection yeah then also another opportunity for learning is um, institutionalizing uh, the devolved climate finance at the Kenya national government. Um, and we also had last month, we also held an informal learning event, basically to promote a coherent approach to the management of devolved climate finance. And the, the quality standards and the best practices based on our pilot 
from the from the five pilot counties where the world climate finance was uh, piloted in Kenya. So it's drawing on on that expertise in the pilot counties that um, we are scaling out now to the other 42 counties in Kenya to cover the entire country. Um, another opportunity in learning is that uh, probably have a communication plan tailored to the needs of uh, different stakeholders at different stages, um, especially when, when we are scaling out so that we can develop and deliver uh, uh, ensuring that we have co coherence and application of common standards. So yeah, that is what I put together. Uh, thank you very much, Esperanza. And to note that the DCF Alliance cuts across uh, the countries that are implementing DCF and brings in a rich experience and context from different countries. And LeFair is interested in this because some of the countries want to use the same mechanism. So this learning is really very useful for us. So next we'll hear from Mamadou who works with ID Africa in Senegal, and he's a technical advisor on climate change and decentralization. So Mamadou, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you a lot. Uh, thank you and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be with you uh, today, talking about uh, the DCF experiences in Senegal in terms of learning lessons, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, I start to uh, talk about the DCF. For us, it is a research action, an advocacy project to promote an experiment approach to decentralized funding for adaptation. We think that DCF is more than a financing mechanism. It is a model of climate change governance. And for the first question uh, about what has the DCF Alliance learned about participatory learning, we have four main lessons. And the first is uh, that the community-based planning. The DCF project served us that planning should come from the community. If we want to address the right problem related to adaptation on climate change, we have to give voice to the base communities that are best able to identify the most relevant adaptation options in order to avoid maladaptation. Uh, the second lesson is we have an uh, uh, inclusive approach. An inclusive approach uh, with uh, gender, economic uh, sector, territories, and partnership. The third uh, lesson is we have to make the focus on public goods for financing priorities sector. The fourth lesson now is that uh, we have to improve flexibility iteration for a successful model. That includes these dimensions, economical, uh, social, environmental, and uh, uh, political. So uh, for the first lesson, for, for the first question, this is the, the answers we, we, we have drawn. And for the second, question. What are the challenges and opportunities for mainstreaming learning into national process and institutions? Here are uh, our uh, response. First, uh, the first challenge for us is how to operationalize the DCF mechanism. And for this, we have to improve the adaptation local committee we have to help the communities to control uh, locally the funds. 
we have to plan and we to, to, to make uh, tools for climate information. And the first is to make a tracking adaptation and measuring development becomes uh, for the uh, evaluation. In the fact, uh, on this project, we uh, elaborate the DCF guide. We elaborate also uh, two other guides on local planning, including climate change, and also uh, the climate finance access guide. So uh, it is uh, our first challenge. The second, uh, the other challenges are how to scale up the DCF initiative at national and international level. It will be a, a very recent challenge for us. Okay. And how to make adaptation committees autonomous and sustainable. Also, how to convince central government to integrate climate change into planning budget and also make a budget of local communities sensitive to climate change. We have also to make the focus on public good and funding resiliency. In terms of opportunities, opportunities, it is to uh, work with diverse stakeholders. Diverse stakeholders at the local level, like adaptation local committee, uh, like regional development agencies, like local authorities and others. And for the national level, we have to work with the national platform supported by the Ministry of Local Authorities. Mm -hmm. We have to make advocacy, energy and fundraising. And for international level, we are uh, on network like DCF Alliance, like uh, Life uh, Life Air. Uh, we are on UNFCCC COP, and we are working in other uh, networks on climate change. And it is to share sharing lessons learned, capitalization, global partnership. And for opportunities, we think that climate change is increasingly taken into account in local planning in Senegal. And we also see that the financial capacities of the local authorities are improved. And also we have the support to the National Territorial Planning Guide integrating cross-cutting dimensions like climate change, like gender, like migration, like nutrition. So uh, we work also to disseminate the meteorological information in partnership with the agencies of meteo and also uh, setting up the national support planning for decentralized funding uh, for resilience and in the term of uh, learned lessons we learned that uh, today's local authorities in a relevant scale for climate development. The training of local actors is necessary for climate change integration. I think we talk it about we talk about this, the training of local authorities, and uh, the participation, the commitment, and empowerment of local actors are fundamental to build the resilience. And the path of decentralization allows to channel funds towards climate vulnerable communities. And uh, at the end, uh, public. Public institutions ensure the appropriation, sustainability, and scaling up of innovation. It is what I uh, have to share with you, and I'm uh, waiting for your questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Tracy, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, thanks, Mamadou, for that sharing, bringing in communities or stakeholders, government, uh, and Life AI really is looking at the whole of society approach and whole of government. How do different government sectors come into supporting adaptation, which is important? 
And uh, the last speaker is Samson Silu, who works with the Local Government Training Institute in Tanzania, and they're also part of the DCF Alliance. And these in-country institutions have been useful in supporting local government capabilities and national governments as well, which is also in line with the, the discussions we had from the least developed countries universities consortium on climate change, having internal capacities to support countries than depending on consultants and uh, external facilitators. Samson, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, my name is Samson Nusiru, as we have been introduced. Uh, from the first questions, which says, what uh, has the Decentralized Climate Finance Alliance uh, learned about, learned about participatory learning. Uh, from the Tanzania side, the DCF mechanism, which has been uh, piloted here, has shown uh, very good advantages to the local communities. It has been a good, uh, uh, it has a good approach, especially in mainstreaming the climate change adaptation planning and also finance uh, systems uh, to the local communities that we have been working and also to the government. Uh, as a Tanzania side, we've been uh, able to learn uh, through the DCF Alliance uh, to learn the different new me mechanisms from our colleagues, uh, even in Kenya, Mali, and Senegal, and uh, from, other from other members. And uh, this has been a very good platform to sharing this uh, kind of knowledge and networking and also building capabilities and also sharing the technical expertise from uh, different members. We have seen the different advantages uh, to the local communities that we've been working here in Tanzania, such as uh, understanding the local community initiatives that has been uh, indigenous knowledge. Since we've been able to include them from the local leaders, from the national leaders who are the policy makers and also planners, so that they have been able to integrate the climate change and gender issues on climate change on the, on the government planning issues. We have seen the different advantages we've, we've been learning here, uh, such as sustainability of these kind of projects, uh, projects which have been uh, uh, initiated by the local communities uh, because of the participatory way of, uh, uh, participatory way of mechanism, which has been used here in Tanzania. And uh, also the value for money, we've been seeing it, and uh, which shows us these projects are very sensitive. And uh, in the near future, we leave this to Sansford Kwai, who is, the, who is working with the ministry. Uh, from the ministry, he will add some few things here. And also from the second questions, uh, what has been the challenges and opportunities in mainstreaming the into uh, international processes and institutions. Well, this has been a good opportunity. Let me start from the opportunities. Uh, we have a number of institutions that have been working uh, in, the, in the DCF and the DCF Alliance as well. Uh, based the, such as uh, this uh, community, non-government organizations, non-government organization, the government institutions, such as the uh, uh, such as learning, learning institutions, academic institutions. Uh, we, are, we have been working together. It has been a good opportunity since that we have been able to plan from the local communities in taking it, uh, taking it to, into, into the high level, which is the national level, uh, to the police makers and also planners. This is a very good opportunity that is opening and uh, is opening for us to be able to, um, to, to, to widen our projects uh, and also big network. And also a good approach such as, such as Tamdi and Mel. Uh, some of the challenges that you've been seeing, uh, so we have very few challenges here, such as financial, financial, uh, lacking of finance in expanding. We want to expand it to uh, almost all the regions here in Tanzania, but the funding issues has been a little bit challenging 
and my, my colleague here, Sanford Kwai from the ministry, will be able to add some few points here. And also uh, uh, lacking capability to politicians and the technocrats uh, has not been, we have not been able enough to uh, train all, almost all of them because of the financial uh, lack of funding uh, on this financial side. Uh, my colleague, uh, San Kwai, is online. He, he will add some things. Okay, thank you, Samson. San Kwai, do you have something to add to Samson's points? San Kwai? Okay, so thank you, Samson. For those insights, um, if Sanque has something to add, he might add or not. I don't think he's online. Tracy. Ah, he's not I online. Chat. Okay, thank I'm not you. Sure I haven't seen. So thank you so much for your insightful lessons. Uh, there are some questions that came up in the chat box that I was able to pick. There's a question for Esperanza. Is the participatory approach also used in decision making and adapting the program to learning and results? If so, how has this worked and do you have any tips? Then another one to Mamadou, how do you follow participatory planning, but also provide ideas for innovation or expert advice to avoid multi-adaptation? So any responses to those in the few minutes? Esperanza, are you in, on mute? Oh, Mamadou, if you're ready, if okay. you have any response to the questions raised. I, I think that Esperanza is here. So, okay. Uh, for the question of uh, maladaptation and how to avoid it, we think that uh, if we give the floor to the local communities, they are able to show how they adapt them, their activities on climate change. It is not something new. Uh, they live with these challenge, challenges with, uh, on many years and they develop, they already developed some kind of adaptation. So, what we have to do here is to support them to improve uh, this local adaptation. Because if we uh, come on the field with uh, technical, uh, technical solutions, it can be not adapted, adapted to uh, the community or uh, socially uh, accepted. So uh, I think that if we give the floor if we plan uh, at the, uh, on the bottom up uh, approach uh, with um, real participation, we, participatory, we can have uh, good adaptation and it can help us to avoid maladaptation. Thanks. Thank you, Mamadou. Esperanza, do you want to add anything? I think uh, Esperanza said in the chat that her internet's a bit um, ah, slow okay. at the moment, so she's going to answer questions in the chat. That's okay, Tracy. Okay, great. Thank you. So we have a few minutes to close, and uh, I want to thank you all, uh, but I want to make a comment on some of the issues that came up about learning. Uh, learning is not between experts and local communities. Uh, I think that pe comment was from Fiona Pasi, which is very good. There's learning between experts and communities. There's social learning that happens between communities within themselves and the indigenous knowledge and practices that they have, giving examples of COVID response and other responses to risks that happen. There's peer learning. And uh, LeFair is also really focusing on that learning between countries and other institutions that are focusing on the same mechanisms. And then co-designing initiatives between practitioners and technical people with the local communities, trying to understand what their needs are that they may not be able to articulate 
in the technical way that we want to see them. And those are areas that also the LAC wants to focus on. How do we learn with communities, take up their issues and document them into what government wants to see to influence policy and practice, which is all very important. So from my part, I want to thank all the speakers, Mohamed Semambo from Uganda, frontrunner country, Alpha Jalo from the Gambia, another frontrunner country, Dr. Yafa from the LAC, who has represented the LAC initiative, and Fiona Pasi for facilitating our outside expert advice, and Grace Ineza as well, plus all the facilitators and our volunteers, Michael and Alex. Thank you so much. So I want to hand over to Claire Shakya, Director, Climate Change Group IID, to give us a few closing remarks. And I want to thank everybody for creating this time to share with us. And also add that uh, the LDC Initiative for Adaptation and Resilience is focusing on creating a community of practice to share government learning. Government has been doing a lot of things, a lot of learning, which doesn't get out. But this is the time to share between countries, regions, and bring the practice to the global level. So this is very useful as a conversation starter for that community of practice. Claire, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Tracy. I'm, I'm standing in um, for Gebru Jemba, who's the LDC technical lead um, for this initiative. Um, and I, I mean, I'm looking forward to hearing from the different groups. Um, I hope we can share that on, on the waiver platform, perhaps. Um, and I see that some, some organizations are offering um, some of their approaches, which perhaps also we can share with each other on waiver, because this is the start for the LDC groups um, uh, um, th under this initiative for effective adaptation and resilience, um, trying to get the learning working um, at all the different levels that it needs to, whether that's um, between communities and local governments and social movements at the local level, or whether it's between local and national, or whether it's between the different countries that are in the front runners, or between the front runners and the rest of the LDC group, and indeed other countries that are interested to learn what are effective approaches to um, supporting action on the ground that communities really can drive. So I, I've just learned so much today and I'm looking forward to talking it all through with Gabriel. I'm, I'm sure he's very sorry that not to have been part of this. Um, but if you have other thoughts, please do feed them in because we are in the process of trying to rapidly understand what has worked in different contexts, what, what really enables that sort of buy into the learning as well, not just the learning happening, but that it's shared in ways that are effective and influential and really start to drive different ways of working um, to get to this business unusual that we've been talking about. So um, just to add my thanks to Tracy, to all of those that have contributed, I've really enjoyed the discussion myself um, and look forward to further interaction and, and getting hearing more of what you think does work, but also let us know what doesn't work because we definitely don't want to do that. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, everyone.